Hey. All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Chapter 12, get ready. Tell it's a little okay. smaller group, but that's okay. Got a great message for everybody today. It's good. It's on no, um, Romans 12. If you want to turn your Bible with me to Romans 12, you can. And if you don't have it accessible, I'm going to have it up here on the big screen as well. Okay. Talked to a Luther pastor this week right down the road at Faith Walk and he told me he won't do the PowerPoint. He says he wants his people to be looking through the Bible or looking at their hands. And I can understand his point, but I think it does help out as well, too. So I think it's a good thing. I don't know. But I hope you guys enjoy as well, too. But here, Romans 12 is a great chapter, all right, because now we're going to see uh, Christian living, Christian practicality, things going on. The first 11 of chapters of Romans got us here. And now we're going to see how we ought to live, how we ought to be, and it's a powerful chapter indeed. And i got a few quotes here, because you guys know I like some quotes to help understand things. And this first one says, the problem with living sacrifices is that they keep crawling off the altar. Okay? All right? That's us, right? If we're a living sacrifice to God, you know, we read in Romans 7 how Paul said he does the things he does not want to do, the things he wants to do he doesn't do. We keep crawling off the altar, we've got to keep putting ourselves back on the altar. You know, keep putting ourselves back on the altar for God. All right? And that's the problem with living sacrifices there. And that God, if we're going to see, wants us to be a living sacrifice. He's not interested in dead sacrifices. He's interested in living sacrifices. And here's a, uh, here's a quote from a guy named John MacArthur. It says, The entrance fee to God's kingdom is nothing but the annual dues or everything. All right? That's a good way to look at it. We are saved completely by grace, you know, through faith alone. It doesn't cost anything to be saved. You know, it's totally free. We don't work our way up to be right in the kingdom of God. No, we get saved right where we are sinners. Christ died first while we we're still his enemies. But yet, the annual dues are everything. It costs us our lives. It costs us everything we have once we're saved because we're to keep giving it over to Christ because we have this, this sinful nature in us that wants to keep doing things our way. And we've got to keep letting go of that and keep submitting ourselves to Christ. And, uh, and I wrote up here in my head, and sacrifice the right to yourself. Really, when we're saved, the more mature we become in salvation, the more we get to know God, the more we realize I have to sacrifice myself and the rights that I feel I have to God. And I need to follow after Him. I need to obey His Word. I need to submit unto Him. And that's, a, that's a, it's a, a daily thing. It's not going to happen immediately for anybody. But it's a thing called sanctification, and it takes time. But you should be able to look back in your life and be like, well, that's where I was before. Here's where I am now. Well, I wonder where, praise God, I'm going to be days from now or months from now or years from now, where God's going to take me, where he's going to lead me. It should be a, a continual walk, and it's going up, up the hill right there. All right? God helps us with that, fortunately, or there'd be no hope at all. All right, uh, one more quote. It says, in short, supernatural living is conforming our outer lives to our inner lives. Living out the redeemed, purified, and holy nature we have in Jesus Christ, becoming in practice what we are in position as a new creation. You know, when we're saved, we're saved as sinners. You know, it doesn't mean that, that all of a sudden we don't have the sinful desires we used to have. It doesn't mean that we don't have all the, the bad with us that we used to have. But God has saved us. He's cleansed us. He's washed us. Now as we grow with God, that stuff should start to appear. You know, those sinful desires, desires should start to go away. Now you're at war with those sinful desires. Before you just did whatever you wanted to do. Now you're at war with those things. You're not doing that. We saw this week we do our uh, Truth Project. And the Truth Project this week was all about anthropology and about man. And it showed uh, Maslow's scale, the pyramid. And it showed how wrong Maslow's scale was, how it's taught in schools and everybody thinks Maslow's scale is correct because some guy named Maslow said the top of the pyramid of psychology is self-actualization. That's really the bottom of the pyramid. You are a base, you are no different than an animal if all you know is yourself and all you do is feed yourself and you're just self-centered, selfish. If it's all about you, that is as low on the scale as it gets of, of, uh, of rightness and wrongness right there. So this Maslow scale should be flipped around upside down, really. It should be, you know, Christ is on the top of the scale and you are, are baseless right there. And I... I know whenever you look at the Bible or anything, I, I point out if anybody's following along with my daily Bible readings with, with uh, Jacob, who is also named Israel by God, you know, to, 
he, uh, when he gave his blessings to his sons right before he died, half of them got really bad blessings. Half of them got cursings is what they got. And the other half got blessings. And the firstborn, Reuben, he got cursed. While Joseph, who was like the second to last born, Benjamin being the last, he got the firstborn rights. I mean, both his kids got the double portion blessing that weren't even, you know, Jacob's kids right there. There was grandkids. And it shows, and I bet you those guys who got the blessing, you know, like Judah was one of the guys who got the blessing. And you can look at all these guys live and see sin in all their lives. You know why some got the cursing, some got the blessing? I don't know, but I bet you the guys that got the blessing weren't expecting the blessing. I bet the guys, after they heard the first one, Reuben getting cursed and stuff, they thought, well, you know what, I'm no better either. I bet I'm going to get cursed. And that's the way we are to live as humble Christians, is we don't live like, you know, I need all this or I need all that. You know, we're humble before God, and as God chooses to give, he gives. And that's the kind of attitude we're to have. You know, servants of God, not putting ourselves like the disciples were always arguing, who's going to be first in the kingdom of God? Who's going to be first? And Jesus said, that person who is last, is who will be first. That person who serves everyone is who will be first. Not the guy who's all the way up the front saying, I want to be first, I want to be first, all right? That's not the way it works. You know, we need to be humble before God. He needs to be our Lord and our Savior. And as we do that, eventually, that new creation, which we are in Christ Jesus, when we're saved, when we're cleansed of all of our sins, when we're no longer uh, a dead person, but now we're alive in Christ, will start to show on the outside. And that's what we're going to see through this chapter. And... Uh, the way that we get this to happen is from consistent and deliberate renewing of our mind. How do we do that? By reading the Bible, by praying, by fellowshipping with one another about God and our needs and watching out for each other and things. That's how we renew our mind right there. We've got to renew it in the Word. I'm almost done with all my quotes. Don't worry, it's only a few slides of quotes. I uploaded them in the front, most of them. The center of God's will is our only safety. You know, I don't know if you ever hear these stories about Corey Ten Boom. You know, Corey Ten Boom has a lot of really interesting stories that she wrote. You know, she was a woman that really, really suffered during the Holocaust and the, all these terrible things. Well, this was her sister. Her sister actually had some things to say, too, that were pretty good. And what her sister said, and you got to think, these people, I mean, everything was taken from them. They were being killed. Their families were killed. Awful, terrible things happened left and right to these people. But he, she said, the center of God's will is our only safety. Think about it. If you were in the Holocaust... In some concentration camp where people were torturing you and you were seeing your buddies and family members die left and right and everything. This is what she said is the most important thing. The only safety we have is in the center of God's will. And, and that she could say that in the midst of such a turbulent storm is amazing right there. But, it, but it's where uh, it's truth. It's, it's, it's a good statement of truth, she said, that lines up with God's word that we'll be looking at. And uh, this quote here says, A transformed mind produces a transformed will by which we become eager and able, with the Spirit's help, to lay aside our own plans and to trustingly accept God's. No matter what the cost, the continual yielding involves the strong desire to know God better and to comprehend and follow His purpose for our lives. Now this, this is where it comes. It comes in, in continually letting go and holding on to God. And so I gave you guys a story maybe a year ago. Maybe I used it since then. I don't know. But you picture a guy in a boat. And this guy's boat is sinking, and he's got all of his worldly goods, all of the money he's made his whole life, his treasure chest with him right there. He's able to save it from the flood or whatever happened. And Jesus comes along in his boat, and he says, come into my boat. And the guy says, hold on, hold on. And he's trying to drag this giant chest of treasure from the world with him. And Jesus says, that's not coming with us. You cannot come with us if you hold on to your worldly treasures. You need to let go of everything and follow me. And that's the only way to get in that boat. You've got to come to that decision, like, am I willing to follow Christ and leave everything behind? Or does this stuff mean more to me than what God means to me? And it should be that God means more to us than everything. Yeah, there's going to be a grind inside of us when we have to let go of things we don't want to let go of. But it's an important grind that has to happen right there, okay? Does that mean we should all have nothing at all? No, that's not true at all, okay? But that stuff should not own us, okay? If it came down to the boat situation with our stuff, we've got to be ready to just let go of that stuff and hold on to Christ right there, okay? You know, it does say things in the Bible like a, a person that doesn't take care of his family is worse than an unbeliever, you know? And how's a person going to take care of their family unless they've got a job, unless they do well, things like that. But yet, we know that Christ is supposed to be above everything, okay? And this is a continued, continued yielding. You know, it's step by step. Precept upon precept is the Christian walk. 
It's not just a one-time thing and that's it and I live my life in some sinful, wicked way however I want to live it. That's not the example we see from Scripture. We never see that. We're not saved by those works, but by all means when we're saved, we're going to start, we're going to start doing good works. We're going to start following Christ. We're going to start changing from the way we used to be to the, to the new creation that we are inside already. All right? In this passage we're about to read, it will utterly destroy the notion that a Christian can be committed to Christ out of but be inactive in his service. That he can love the Lord, but not obey the Lord. That he can be surrendered to the Lord, but not minister for the Lord. True worship cannot be divorced from service. Okay, we're going to see a whole bunch of stuff about service today in this passage. And there's no such thing as a person who says they're a Christian, and you can see no godly stuff in their life at all. Okay? The only way I can see that maybe is they're a brand new Christian, and the roots haven't taken root yet. They're still in the ground root, so the rest of us can't see it. But, but there's someone... We get excited, they say they're a Christian, but as time goes on and we see no fruit whatsoever, that's good evidence that they're not a Christian. And it's good evidence for us to let them know they're probably not a Christian, because they may be blinded themselves or trying to hold on to some false lie, and they still haven't got salvation, so we need to keep preaching the gospel to them and share the truth with them. And I wrote up here, it's actually a Bible verse I wrote up here, but we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And this happened in Acts 14.22. This was like their, their sympathy to the other people who were going through all kinds of problems and heartaches and bad stuff as the early church formed and people being martyred and bad stuff was going on. This was the sympathy that they said to them. We've got to go through many hardships on the way to the kingdom of God. This is just a fact. It's a fact of life. It's a fact that, that we must do. You know, We go through a lot of hardships. And you know what? These hardships will either break us or they'll make us. They'll either make us a stronger person as we go through them, or they'll break us and we'll you know, just be down on the side right there, okay? We might be like a demon, so we definitely don't want to be like a demon, all right? I got some stuff about him in here, too. All right, now we start the scripture, all right? Romans 12.1. What a powerful scripture this is. If you're into memorizing scripture, this is one of those scriptures you want to memorize, okay? Hold the heart. And uh, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. What is our worship? Presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. That's what he calls our worship. It's not doing this or doing that. It's presenting ourselves up to him. A good example is think about uh, Abraham and his son Isaac. And God called him to kill his son Isaac, to take him and to sacrifice him on the mountain, on the altar, to God himself. And this was what he'd been waiting his whole life for his son. This was everything that meant everything to him, his son. But what did Abraham do? He followed God. He took his son. And his son kind of became aware of what's going on. He's like, Dad, you know, where's the ram? And he's like, God will provide. And he's the one that got up. I'm sure his dad didn't have to wrestle him and tie him down on top of the altar. He got up there himself on the altar. So not only was Abraham willing to offer himself as a living sacrifice before God and give God everything that he had, but his son was as well. His son at the time was going to be a living sacrifice. He was also willing that if the Lord told you to do this, by all means, we will follow through with what the Lord said. This is the kind of allegiance they had to God. They were living sacrifices to God. And then God said, stop, don't hurt your son. And it stopped right there. And does that mean that God's going to call us to sacrifice some people? No, that doesn't mean that. We shouldn't take that. That's way out of context and twisted, okay? But we can take that, what God did with Abraham and Isaac, as an illusion of what he would do with his own son one day on our behalf is where we can take that right there. And we can also take it to see the kind of faith that Abraham had and the kind of living sacrifice that he was. And uh, it's the only acceptable worship is the offering of oneself to God, okay? You know, acceptable worship isn't just going to church on Sunday. It's not just, uh, you know, reading a book once in a while that talks about God. It's not that. It's about giving yourself to God. Every day, we got to do it. Every day we wake up, God, take, take me, kill my flesh, my sinful desires, and help me to live more unto you each and every day. You know, help me to follow after you today. Help me to walk after you. Forgive me for the wickedness or sins I did yesterday or the different things that held me fret from you. Help me to follow after you and, and count the cost and hate and abhor the sin that keeps me separated from you. That's how we ought to be. Verse 2 follows right along in line with it. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Remember I told you before, how do we get transformed? 
by the renewal of our mind in the Word. If we're never in the Word, it's going to be hard for us to get transformed. If you only get in the Word from me on Sundays, it's going to be a slow, slow process to ever get there right there. You've got to be in the Word yourself. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. All right? And that's, this, is, this is such a great passage right here. It says so many different things. I could have a sermon just about this verse alone. All right? Because it says that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God. You know, tons of people are like, I don't know what the will of God is for my life. I don't know what God wants me to be. We're going to cover that today. All right? But the only way we're going to ever get to the point where what is the will of God for our life is by submitting ourselves and being a living sacrifice to God. God doesn't tell us something before we need to know it. You know, in the army, they have all this secrecy type stuff sometimes we have. It would be on a need to know basis. The need to know basis, all right? So kind of with God, the need to know basis is after you present yourself as a living sacrifice, he'll show you and lead you where he wants you from there. All right? He's not going to like take some sinful dude who's not sure if he wants salvation, he's not saved yet, and show him, this is everything that I want you to do. No, he's going to bring him to his son first, and that's how he's going to discern it to us. That's how we're going to learn it. It's once we start following God, he'll give us those desires of our hearts. He'll lead us, he'll show us what our gifts are. He'll do these kind of things for us, and we'll see that throughout this chapter. And there's a story of 25 cents at a time, all right? All right, here's a picture. Somebody gets saved, they're all pumped up for God, and, and maybe all they got is a thousand bucks or something, just say with money things, because we can relate to money picture, and they think, I'll give you God my whole thousand bucks. I'll give the whole thing to you. And God's like, no, I don't want your thousand bucks, but I will take it, and I'll take it over time, over a long time, and I'll take it a quarter at a time. A quarter here, a quarter there, a quarter here, and it will eventually lead to where everything you have is expleted for God. But he'll take it over that bit of time from one bit at a time right there. And as we'll find with this one bit at a time, it's probably better. Because if he took it all, we'd probably later be like, oh man, I kind of regret. You know, I wish, I wonder if I should go over there. But as he takes it one bit at a time, we grow, we learn, we, we become more trusting in God. Our faith grows with God. And as that comes, I bet by the end of that thousand bucks that we've spent, if you put in a picture like that, we would be glad that we gave every single penny of it. You wouldn't regret one bit. You know, think about the rich man that went to hell, that Jesus said he built all his barns, he did all this. He's like, now I can just relax and I'm fine. I've done all this with my life and I'm good. And Jesus said, you fool, this night your soul will be demanded of you. And, and your faith and trust was in your goods and they were not in God. Now you'll be in hell forever. And I guarantee you, one minute, once he's in hell, he would have wished he could have given up every single thing that he had to gain Christ. And that and that's what I'm talking about here. And I'm talking about 25 cents at a time, you know. Slow walk is going to be going, but it's got to keep going forward right there. And that's how that's how reality is right there. It's not everything at once. It's, it's a bit at a time there. Now, and this is... Uh, uh, it, this is a uh, still scripture verse right here, too. I don't have a labeled scripture verse, but it is. But I, I top labeled this scripture passage here. This is uh, 12, 3 through 8. It says, uh, it says, but do what comes natural to you, speaking and serving gifts. All right? Because we're going to talk about stuff. Something that's really interesting is there's two big chapters in the Bible that talk about spiritual gifts. Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. 12. So they're both 12, so it's easy to kind of remember. Corinthians 12, Romans 12, okay? Corinthians 12 has all this speaking in tongues and healing and all these powerful type of things, right? Romans 12 doesn't have so much that stuff. The only thing it has as close to that is prophecy. It does call prophecy here in this passage. And why is that? Well, I truly believe why that is, is because Corinthians was written before Romans. I know in your Bible, Romans comes before Corinthians, but it's just the way they organize it, okay? Romans was written, it was one of the later books before Paul died right there, and it was written, it was written after the book of Corinthians were. If you look through the epistles, you can see that the powerful things we saw in Acts with them healing people and all these miracles and powerful things started to disappear. That toward the end, you didn't see any of those kind of things going on anymore. And why is that? Because they were meant for the first century. They were meant to grow the church. What did Jesus say? He said, this generation demands a sign. But the only sign that I will give them will be the sign of Jonah. Which the sign of Jonah was he was in the he was in the belly of the whale for three days and was spit out, or big fish, however you want to put it, doesn't we don't know if it's a whale. But it's a sign of the resurrection. That's once again another thing that happened in the Old Testament to show what would happen with Jesus. 
three days he went down and before he rose up again. You know, three days he went down to the bosom of Abraham to free all those guys who were believers before who didn't have uh, their salvation paid for, but yet they were in like an upper level type thing, and he's freed them all right there. But yet, that's the same way as we see, we don't see the spiritual gifts anymore like we did in the book of Acts. Because I can tell you one thing, I look for them. I watch things. People tell me, like, David Wilkerson, he said prophecy. Well, I look on the internet, and I see that he had like 100 fake prophecies too. I see that he said this would happen, that would happen. All these things that happen on certain dates, it never happened. It says in the Bible, if anybody gives you a false prophecy, they're a false prophet, don't even listen to anything that they say. They're worthless. If somebody makes a mistake, they're worthless. That's not God, and it's not right. It's evil is what they're doing. And they're, they're offering strange fire before God, is what I like to call it. As my friend John McCarthy wrote a book. It's not my friend, but a guy that I respect. And my mentor, I guess you call it, but he wrote a book, Strange Fire, The Sons of Aaron the Priest, the brother of Moses. These guys were priests in the tabernacle of God. And when he made them priests, they were wicked men. And they brought in a strange fire before the Lord to offer before God. And God killed them dead. Killed them right on the spot. Killed him. Moses' brothers, Aaron's sons, bam, right on the spot. You can read about the book of Leviticus. And then he even told Aaron, don't even leave the tabernacle for one week. You're not even allowed to mourn. You're not allowed to be sad. These guys are not to be celebrated. What they did was an abomination before me. And this is how I look at these new spiritual gifts that we see all over the television and everything with all these fake guys saying send me all your money and you'll get healed and all kinds of stuff like that because it's not real and what we can see here is we can see in romans 12 speaking and serving gifts speaking life to people speaking scripture to people speaking the gospel to people and serving people you know serving them in the same way that we know serving is right there counting ourselves as second and other people as first and this is what we're going to see. And the only gift we don't see like that is the gift of prophecy. And why is that? Well, because Paul was an apostle. He still has prophecy coming forward, okay? John, the last guy to die, he still had prophecy coming forward for the whole book of Revelation and things like that. And then there's also two different kinds of prophecy. There's prophecy that's called foretelling, and there's prophecy that's forthtelling, okay? The kind that we saw in the Old Testament and with the early apostles was foretelling. We saw them saying, this is what will happen. This is what will come to be. And we know exactly to the exact day that Jesus would come and die for us. You know, we know that from the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. It had to the day, to the exact day that Jesus would come and die and be the sacrifice for everybody. We also have all these other things. We have things about the end of the world, revelations we have all those. Those were foretellings. Now we have foretelling. What is foretelling? Foretelling, you could even call what I'm doing right now, is I'm preaching the Bible, I'm preaching the gospel, I'm sharing the truth. That's forth telling, all right? So let me get that straight as we enter into our spiritual gifts here, which you won't see any of the ones like Corinthians 12 in here. Like I said, it's written at a later time, and you can see those things disappeared. You can even see it in the fact that, that Paul, when he spoke to Timothy at a later time, he said, drink a little wine for your stomach, you know, because he had some kind of stomach pain problems. I mean, Paul had the power to lift people up from the dead, to heal people and stuff. And yet at this time, Paul said, drink a little wine for some. He said, take some medicine to make yourself feel better, is basically what he was telling the guy. You know, now it had gone to medicine right there, rather than, it be, you know, I say you're healed, you're fine, Timothy, don't worry anymore. You don't see that anymore, okay? See these things drifting off, even as the Bible was being written. And now we have the complete work of the Bible. Before, they didn't have any of the New Testament. They needed these signs and things that Jesus brought with them. You know, feeding the 4,000 with four loaves, 5,000 with five loaves. They needed that so that way they could see, wow, this is God. Now we have something even more powerful than that. You know, somebody could tell us, you know, like I saw somebody get, get healed or this or that. And we'd be like, oh, okay, maybe we think it's true, maybe we don't think it's true. And then we just move on and forget it. But when the Word of God speaks to us, it seeps into our heart. It never comes back void. It's much more powerful than any bit of news and anything else it could ever be. This is more powerful than everything. So really, the Word of God has replaced all those signs. Because we no longer need any signs. We've got the signs right here. All right? It says, But for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Okay? Every one of us can probably self-apply that to ourselves. But to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. 
if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our servant, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who con contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Okay, so we all got these different gifts right here. And it says we should do them in proportion to how we've been given them, you know. You know, maybe you haven't given the, the proportion of evangelism or something to the point that you'd be like great comfort. But you can share, share your faith a little bit right there, you know, and tell us what Jesus did to you to somebody right there. But we're all given different things, you know. Uh, I, I read a, a thing by R.C. Sproul as he talked about this. And he has his own college, called an uh, own seminary called Ligonier Ministries there, Ligonier Seminary down in Orlando, or Sanford, right close to Orlando. And he said sometimes he'd get guys who want to be ministers. And they'd be like, he can obviously see the guy wasn't cut out to be a minister. Somebody, you know, told him a bunch of nice, puffy stuff, and he thought, this is what I need to be. And he can't make it, and everything's falling apart for him, and that's just not his gift. He's trying to operate outside of his gift. And where do we, and this is where it comes to, we can't decide what our gifts are before we first become a living sacrifice to God. Before we first give everything over to him, we're following him, then he'll lead us, he'll show us what our gifts are, he'll show us, you know, we'll see it obvious. Other people will see it obvious. As we have our gifts going, other people will see what that person's gifts are, you know, so we can even share it, you know, and share it in truth. Not like the guy R.C. Sproul said, where somebody told some poor young kid, you should be a preacher, and the guy maybe never was cut out to be a preacher or something, and now the guy has all these troubles. But share it as we truly see it, and share with people, like, wow, I really see this gift in you. I can really see these different things in you. And I can see gifts in you guys. I almost label gifts in almost every one of you guys, right? I'm not going to single out or say them because if I can't say it, everybody is going to have her fear, feeling her or something. But really, we can have, we can see these gifts. And we can see that, that they shine out. And they shine out from first becoming a living sacrifice to God. And we got to remember, like, members of the body. You know, and it talks about this in Corinthians too. You know, like, does the hand say to the, to the hand, I, I don't need you? No, we're all needed in the body of Christ. That's why it's so awful when I run into people who don't go to church and they're like, ah, there's something I don't like about that, whatever. And I'm thinking, not only are they being robbed from all the gifts that God has from the body of Christ, but they're robbing all those people in the church, if they're really a believer, from the gifts that God's given them that they could bring to the church as well right there. And what are the gifts now? Speaking and serving gifts. And what do we, I tell you, that we need this. We need good fellowship. We need tightness. We need bonding. We need to be able to lean on each other as we uh, follow the Lord and, and, and we're going that way. And these are the kind of gifts that we need right here. And these are the gifts right here as they're explained. You know, it goes through teaching, prophecy. It goes through, uh, it goes through uh, exhorting. That means encouraging somebody, building them up. It goes through uh, contributing, people to give, and generosity. Okay, it goes through those who are, who are leading, you know, who help lead other people and do different things. And ones who have acts of mercy and with cheerfulness, you know, mercy is something, like I said, mercy means not justice. Mercy means the person demands justice is deserved, and yet you've given them mercy. That's what God gives to us. And, you know, people have a gift of mercy even to look beyond that and look beyond somebody, how they hurt them or how they said something bad to them and, and overcome that and help heal and help help that person rather than just throw them off to the side. All right. And this is a quote right here. It says, When our lives are on the altar of sacrifice, we will have no problem discovering or using our spiritual gifts. They cannot be recognized except as we use them. Okay? When a believer walks in holy obedience to the Lord, filled with the Holy Spirit and serving God, it will become apparent to him and to others what his gift is and how it blesses the body of Christ. So just like I told you guys, you know, as you walk with Christ, other people are going to see what your gifts are, and it's going to also become apparent to you what your gift is. And uh, what do we have to do first, what I wrote down? First, submit yourself to God, and then you will see what He has for you. Okay, it's not a thing like, oh, I wonder what God has for me. Possibly I'll give my life over to Him. You know, I'll count the cost and, 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 and say, you know, Jesus, save me. I'm a sinner. Help me. Well, I wonder, though, maybe first I'll see it. It doesn't work that way. First, we give ourselves wholly over to Him. And maybe we've already given ourselves wholly over to Him. We still don't know. You just keep giving yourself wholly over to Him, and you'll find out, and you'll see. It'll be in God's time, and you'll see what these gifts He has for you. All right? And, uh, and then this is back to Scripture again. This is at uh, verse 9 to 13. It says, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. 
Serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. That's a lot of things right there, okay? And this is what it's calling out to all of us right here, okay? The gifts, some of us are stronger than other gifts and stuff. This is for everybody right here, okay? And what does it say? It says, let love be genuine. Don't like have a two-faced love or, you know, something I think is not really love. You know, love is selfless. You know, you can read a lot about love in Corinthians chapter 13. It says, abhor what is evil. You're supposed to hate it. In fact, in some verses it does say hate what is evil instead of abhor. And if you look at what this Greek word is, it's the strongest word for hate that the Bible has. And that's what we're supposed to do against our sin. Against those things. What is sin? Anything that doesn't bring glory to God. Anything that God doesn't want you to do. That's sin. We're to hate that evil. Now there's two different kinds of evil. There's evil that results from our sin. And then there's evil like a hurricane that kills thousands of people. Or you know all these other kind of evils right there. We can't do anything about those kind of evils. That's the kind of stuff that God's dealing with and doing things with. We can't do that. But we can do something about our sin. Because once we're a new creation in Christ Jesus... We are no longer slaves to that sin. We're not slaves to Christ. Yeah, that sin's always going to be pulling us different ways and things like that. But now we're serving Him. And how are we supposed to deal with this? How are we supposed to fight the fight, the good fight of faith, the good fight against this sin? Is we're supposed to hate it. If you hate something, it's unlikely going to keep doing it. So it wouldn't be like, you know, I got this one sin, but man, do I like doing that sin? That's where you got to stop the person right there and say, stop. You're not supposed to like doing that sin. You're supposed to hate that sin. What does the Word of God say about it? Start getting this scripture and you start seeing what God has to say about it and hate it. Hate it like the way God hates. God does hate. Everybody think God doesn't hate. There's a lot of scriptures that says God hates. God hates, hates sin. He hates evil right there. God hates the wicked, it says in the Bible. Hates them right there. He chooses some. Some he doesn't choose right there. But God does hate. And we should, there's a healthy hate and there's an unhealthy hate. The hate of sin is a very healthy hate. We should hate sin to an extreme degree. Does that mean that we're going to punish the sinner? No, we're not going to punish the sinner because only God's going to punish, okay? We're still going to preach the gospel to him. We're going to love him. We're going to look past that sin. But we're not going to take part in that sin with him. We're not going to tell him that sin's okay, okay? In fact, it's probably better to avoid talking about that sin with him and talking about Jesus with him, okay? Because talking about that sin is just going to get them more riled up than they already are against you. Talk about Jesus and get the gospel. I read something my friend posted this. I told you I'm finding these new friends, and Joe's following with me, two evangelists, street preacher type guys. And one group of them recently went into a mosque. I don't know if it was in Cleveland or where it was, but somewhere, and these guys all knew each other. And the mosque had this Muslim day where they wanted to share their faith with all these people and tell them what it's like to be a Muslim, why they should be a Muslim. And these dudes sat through 40 minutes of learning about what it is to be a Muslim. And they knew that this was coming. They said, now you have your question and answer time. So these guys, you know, street preachers, loving Jesus type guys, went in there for a different purpose than to become a Muslim. He got up and he said, I first have to tell you where I'm coming from. I have to tell you that I believe that God made the heavens and the earth in six days. I have to tell you I believe sin came through Adam and Eve. I have to tell you that I believe the curse fell upon all mankind. And he went through all stuff and he got to the gospel. He goes, but I have to tell you, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for our sins and paid the price of the penalty and was our substitute so that we could have eternal life. He did this right in a mosque with a whole bunch of other Muslims that were there too, trying to do their evangelizing, and he went in there and shared the gospel with all of them. You know, many Muslims don't know what the gospel is. They're not allowed to listen to the gospel, not to look at it. This guy got to go into the mosque and share it before everybody. And then he said, they said, there was a lot of people in the public that went to this mosque, because, you know, there's a lot of support now for Muslim stuff, because we feel they're the underdog, so they must be okay. Not all times the underdog okay, all right? But he said, the rest of the public, he, they said, we're going to do some prayers now. You know, well, they all bow down and put their face on the ground. And he goes, after that, if you'd like to speak more about the Muslim religion, we'd love to answer more questions. So he said him and his five friends were the only ones that stayed. Everybody else in the public got up and left. They're like, that stuff's not for me, I guess, right? But, and then they got to share the gospel more. Because as they asked the people, they said, but this is, what we, this is what we see. How is it that it's not like this? So they shared the gospel all night long with all these Muslims in their mosque. I thought, man, what a story, man. How powerful is that? And that's, that's, and that's, what, that's what this is holding to right here, you know? Sure, they hate the Muslim religion. Sure, they hate the evil that it's bringing. But yet they went in there and they brought the gospel to them. And they, I mean, what an opportunity these guys had. I'm, I'm looking forward to getting connected to these guys more and more. In fact, I'm on a radio show with one of these guys February 2nd. I'll send you the link. But he's interviewing me about some stuff on a Tuesday night uh, a week, two weeks from now. 
But this says, as a poor but is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, and outdo one another in showing honor. Okay? So that means we've got to say, you know, that guy, that brother, he kind of made me feel bad. He hurt my feelings. I'm not going to hang out with him or something. We've got to look past that. We've got to get bigger than that. We've got to be like, you know what? Maybe some situation happened in that guy's life, and that's why he treated me that way. Or I don't know what it is. But either way, I'm going to forgive him the same way Jesus forgave me. And I'm going to keep trying to do good to him, even though he's done evil to me. All right? And that, that's the way we should be. It says here, do not be slothful in zeal. You know, zeal is that energy, that fervency. You know, we're fervent in the Spirit, serving the Lord, and we're doing all these things. It says be constant in prayer. That's a key. All these things can't happen unless we're in prayer all the time, okay? Somebody that has no prayer life is no Christian, okay? I don't know who said that, but it's a good saying, and it really lines up with the rest of it. If there's no prayer life, there's no belief. If we don't call out to the Lord, if we don't pray to Him, we don't trust Him, it's not a real thing that we have right here. We're just going through the motions. You know, we're being like Pharisees, outwash tombs or something, and real wicked on the inside, nothing to do. we got to be in prayer. Prayer is how everything happens. Constant in prayer. We need so much prayer, it's unbelievable. If anybody ever tells me they're praying for me, I'm like, thank you. Thank you so much. I need every single prayer that I can get, okay? And I want to pray for other people, too. They tell me the prayers, and we pray for them. Prayer is super important. And it says to contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality, okay? We should be showing hospitality. And this goes on with Scripture here in verse 14. And it says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Remember when this was written, this was when you know people were being killed like crazy. I mean, this wasn't the peaceful society that we have, that we can have freedom of religion and practice, and we could go into a mosque and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. This wasn't anything like that back then, okay? It says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight, okay? That's something every one of us, I know it happens to me all the time, we wise in our own sight. You know, we want to be... You know, match ourselves up with the Word of God, and where we don't match up, we want to humble ourselves, submit ourselves, and change to Him. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Okay? This is some hard stuff right here. Real hard stuff to apply to our lives. Those people who have wronged us, done terrible things, to show them love, to, to not repay evil for evil, for all those kind of things. And here's where the key is, okay? And I'm about to hit this next week. I'm excited for Romans 13. Romans 13 talks all about the government and how we're supposed to deal with government and why the government was put in place and how God put them in place. And it says the government was put in place to do justice, to kill people who kill, you know, to put in prison those who break the law. Is it our personal thing to do? No, it's the government's thing to do. God also put the government in place. So if somebody, they're trying to kill you or something, let's hope the government is going to take care of that person. Now, you shouldn't be taking care of that person. They're just supposed to take a person. Now, if they can't, in the meantime, self-defense, I'm not, there's nothing saying against the Bible, against self-defense. But it's not supposed to be a thing of vengeance, of revenge, like, the guy did that to me and I've got a plan for him. It's not like that. That says, revenge is the Lord's. We're going to hit that next slide. Vengeance is mine. Is revenge bad? No. But it's not to be taken by you. It's God. God wouldn't do anything evil, right? So, but God is vengeful, very vengeful. It says there's not one thing that God misses. He's going to pay the wicked for every single sin they've ever done. In a much more severity than any of us can ever repay the wicked for. In fact, such a severity, you'd be like Paul or something, being like, oh, please, God, or Moses, don't let that happen to them. You know, bring it on me right then, because it's going to be so severe on them, the wickedness. Our job is not the wickedness revenging back. Our job is to show love. God, you know, our master, he's the one who's going to take care of those things. The government, which he instituted, even if it's a wicked government, no matter what, it's God's government that he's instituted, they're supposed to be carrying out the justice in the land for things, okay? It shouldn't ever be like time past has been with heresies or something, like we're going to burn the heretic, okay? Never is that, are we supposed to do that, okay? In the Old Testament, yeah, sometimes God had to do that. New Testament, you don't see that. The government is supposed to take care of those things. You're supposed to preach in love. You're supposed to preach in truth. Sometimes love is very offensive. The gospel is very offensive. I bet those Muslims, some of them were probably very angry. They'll probably consider having another question in open time answer for the public in that mosque right there. But we're not the ones to deal out the vengeance. It's God's. We're supposed to live in harmony with one another, okay? We're supposed to live in peace. How hard is it for us to share the gospel when we have some kind of bad animosity between somebody else, okay? We've got to let that go. All right, it says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all, okay? As far as it depends on you, on your side, as far as you can, try to be peaceful. 
Do the best you very well can. Yeah, you're not perfect. None of us are perfect. We're all going to mess up from time to time. But do the best you can to live in peace and be peaceable with all, is what the Bible says. And here, it's revenge belongs to God, is where I wrote it. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And God's vengeance is going to be extreme. Okay, an eternity in hell, in a place that the Bible describes as pitch blackness, and yet ongoing fire, where the worm dies, but it never dies, just keeps on going on and on. It's like, you know, it's, it's, as, it's as bad, it's the Dante's Inferno, all those kind of books don't even touch how bad it's going to be in hell. It's going to be beyond our, they, the good saying that I've heard before is, for those who are believers, this is the closest to hell we're going to get with whatever suffering and pain we see. For those who aren't believers, this is the closest to heaven. This is the closest to bliss, even at their worst point in this life, they're ever, ever going to see in life. You know, they could be broke, homeless, uh, whatever, you know, diseased, cancer, dying. That's still the best they're ever going to get to in all of eternity if they don't know Jesus and they're going to hell. That's how bad it's going to be. The vengeance that God's going to deal out is so far worse than any vengeance we could possibly deal out, you know. Praise God that God gave us a government. Some guy could go to prison or something for a little while and hopefully have time to repent and change and not end up going to hell, you know, because he comes to Christ. But that's next week's chapter, Romans 13. It says, uh, it says, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. This is still scripture right here. This isn't a quote right here, okay? This is the last part of Romans 12. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So how is it that we deal with all the trouble and the bad persecution and the conflict and the sin that's all over the world? It's by doing good to them, okay? And that's a hard way, okay? Most people are like, you know, you've done bad to me, I'm going to do bad to you. That's not what the Bible says. It says to overcome evil by doing good. We're supposed to do good to them, even though they've done evil to us, okay? And that, I mean, that's what we got to do. I mean, those Corey Ten Boom things and stuff, you listen to those stories, that lady was sharing the gospel with her guards. That lady was, the people who were torturing her and killing her and doing all that stuff, she was loving them and praying for them, wanting them to get saved and find Jesus. Look at Jesus on the cross, the same people that crucified him. He said, God, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, the same people that did this, you know, that Stephen, the first martyrs, they're stoning him to death, killing him. He's just one of the first seven deacons who was ever made. And he's like, you know, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's the Christian attitude we're to have. It's not an easy attitude. It's not something, it's easier, much easier said than done. But it's one of those things is we make ourselves a living sacrifice, it becomes possible through the help of the Holy Spirit, through constant prayer, through all these kind of things, okay? And that's, that's where we're to be headed right there. And heaping burning coals on his head. I mean, that almost makes you feel bad for doing good to the person that does evil. Because if they don't repent, you've just made them suffer even more in hell. Because they're still being evil and stuff to you, even though you're being good to them. And that, that's a hard way right there, okay? There's also a, a, an analogy that with the Egyptians, that they would do something like put a hot plate with coals on top of their head and have to walk around with this burning thing on their head. It's like a punishment right there. And that was like an analogy that maybe they had to do that then. But I don't know. To me, it sounds like an analogy. The guy's going to go to hell and he's going to get more burning coals heaped on top of his head, all right? So what should we do? We should hate sin. It's a good thing to hate, like I said. You know, God, God hates it. God hates, hates the wicked, it says. He doesn't want us to, he wants us to separate from sin. You know, he died for our sin. He paid the sinner thing. I mean, that was the most excruciating thing in it. Jesus is the judge. You know, it says in the Bible that Jesus is the judge of all. It's not God the Father is the judge. You know, it's, they're one God, but the three persons in one God. But it even says in the Gospels that, that the Father has given the Son all authority and all judgment. He's the one who's sending people to hell or not sending them to hell. He's the one saying, I never knew you. Depart from me right there. He's the one who created hell. It says he's created all things. Nothing was created without Jesus. He made every single thing that was. There wasn't a thing that is that wasn't made by Jesus. So, we've got to hate that sin and do, do right. And it, there's a guy named Demas. I always quote 1 John 2.19. So when I saw this scripture, I thought, well, I've got to post this scripture too. Because it lines right up with okay? 1 John 2.19 says they left us because they were never of us. You know, showing that not everybody who claims to be a Christian is always a Christian. If they don't live out the life and they start going in the opposite direction, it's either one of two things has happened. They're backsliding or they were never a Christian. The same antidote for both of them, share the gospel with them. Share salvation with them just in case and make sure they're getting back on track because you don't know the difference. 
of which is which with them. But it says in, Ad, in Timothy, it says, For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Okay? He loved this present world. He loved the sin. He loved the treasure chest. When I told you about the treasure chest and the guy with the boat, he loved that treasure chest so much, he's like, you know what? I can't get in the boat with you, Jesus. I'll find some other way. And he just starts paddling off right there. But the problem is there is no other way. The Bible doesn't give anything for any other way. In fact, it continually says that Jesus is the only way. So there's no hope right there. So this poor guy, Demas, came so close, yet wasn't there. Judas, three years with God Almighty, three years with Jesus on the ground, and still went his own way right there. And what he did wasn't repentance when he killed himself. Okay, real repentance means you come before God. Feeling sorry for yourself, you kill yourself, you're just compounding the sin. Yeah, he may have felt the shame and the wickedness, the evil. It says the wages of sin is death. So he felt all that death and bad stuff, but he never repented and turned to God. He killed himself. That's not repentance right there. That's not turning to God. And he was with Jesus three years. Demas, I don't know how many years he was with these guys. I'd like to may I'll do a study and search, but it's probably more than three years. You know, these guys went like 20, 30 years preaching the gospel before they died. I mean, you figure, you know, 80, 100 or 90 something is when we think that the John the the revelation was written by John, the last apostle. That's like 60 years this guy was preaching the gospel for right there. How long was Demas with them all? I don't know. But that's what I have for today. And I just wanted to, to share that word with you. I hope it's encouraging to you and to help you find what is my spiritual gift. What's the answer to that? Be a living sacrifice. Follow Jesus with all your heart, and you'll find your gifts. You'll find where God leads you. He'll give you desires of your heart. And what I always say when I especially give that Somalia talk when I was a young man, as I went to in the inner city of Cleveland, this African black guy from straight out of Africa with a full man dress was preaching on a warm day with no air conditioning, and the wind was blowing in. It was just, you know, kind of a strange thing. And he says, he goes, faith by faith, step by step, you keep going until you can go no more. And then you know that's not the will of God for your life. And you go a different direction right there, you know, as you're following God. And I held that when I went to the Army. In fact, I wasn't sure if I wanted to go to the Army or nothing. I'm making a big mistake. What am I doing? After I heard that guy say that, because I was all confused, I thought, you know, this is what I'm going to go with. I'm going to the Army. I make the best. I'm going to give it everything I got. And if it's not enough, then God will have some different thing for me right there. And that's how, that's, I think it's a, it's a good way. It's a good way to go forward. And I think that's exactly how this chapter is put in. Okay, we offer ourselves a living sacrifice before God. We give Him everything we got. And then He gives us the desires of our heart and we follow after Him. And if they're fruitful and they're going a good direction, we're going good. If we see that it's not fruitful, it's not the right way, then we find another way right there. And that's, that's the way it is right there. It's not to say that there won't be hard times. There's always going to be hard times of tribulation. You just don't give up when there's hard times, okay? Let me tell you, I give that a lot too in my Somalia talk. Because the winners never quit the quitters never win and you've got to keep doing that. But even at that... When I went through all that Special Forces training and Ranger stuff, a lot of those other guys really wanted to be there as well. And they didn't make it. You know, they broke their ankle. You know, their back got hurt. They psychologically didn't make it or something. They gave it everything they got, but they couldn't do it. Obviously, there was another way that God had for them, okay? You know, if they were believers and they were living sacrifices before Him, you know, and that's, that's okay, you know, but that's, that's how it goes. And now, did I have hard pain and time? Yeah, I had terrible times sometimes. But I never quit, and for most of us, I was pretty successful with different things. And the even more important thing than that is that we never quit on God. We don't become a demon and love our sins more than we love God. What do we got to do to our sins? We got to hate them. You know, when we the Holy Spirit's going to convict us when we're a believer and tell us what we're doing that's wrong. We got to hate that. We got to let God forgive me of this. Help me to hate that. Help me to loathe that. Help me to not want anything to do with that, Lord Jesus. Help me to have the same attitude towards sin that you have towards sin. And help me to have a right attitude towards you. That's that's where we got to keep going, and we got to keep praying, constant prayer, if we're going to walk in that way. So, walk away with that. I hope you remember that, and uh, let it work on you. Let, let it do good things in you. Be living sacrifices. Uh, if you bow your heads, we'll go ahead and we'll close in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for each and every person that's here today, Lord God. Thank you for them coming. Thank you for sustaining them. Thank you for drawing them, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the word that you gave us in your scripture, Lord. And thank you for allowing me to speak it forth, Lord, to, 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 to teach it, to open it up, Lord God. Lord, I ask that you, that you open it up even more with each person this week and that you teach them all, Lord, how to be living sacrifices, how to fully rely on you, Lord, how to put you first above all things. Lord, help them to, to, to spend more quarters, Lord God, of their life on you this week 
and help them to, to see the goodness of it, Lord, to see the, to see the fruitfulness of it, to, to find that the love of it, Lord Jesus, to be, to be giving themselves fully over to you, becoming more and more like you each and every day until the day that they each go into glory, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, now there's still coffee and some donuts. Let's go ahead and enjoy yourselves and have a wonderful week.